Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. This evening we have a very interesting broadcast. Ancient prophecy from Enoch reveals global agenda. I really wrestled with the title that I would use this evening because I just could not find the correct title that I felt would really bring out what I want to share with you this evening. And I, quite frankly, I do not, as far as I know, I don't think anyone has ever brought out what I'm going to share. It is very deep. It is very simple, but it is going to, if it does, it does you like it did me, it'll shake you to the core to realize the day you're living in and what the agenda really is that's going on. Why is there a new world order? Why has the Pope of Rome really been pressing for peace and, and, and yet at the same time there's war everywhere? I think I may have found the answer to some of this in the book of Enoch uh, at the very beginning there, starting in chapter 6. But before we get right into the book of Enoch, and, I, and I've got most of the scriptures up here, I had to hand type them there uh, because I could not, well, we won't go into all that, just I, I couldn't co copy and paste what I was wanting to be able to use there. But let's look at a couple of insights here that kind of give some backing for the book of Enoch. One is Rachel Elior. She is a, uh, a Israeli woman who is, works as a professor of Jewish philosophy and, and uh, Jewish mystical thought at the Hebrew University in Israel. Uh, she did a lecture not too long ago called Who Wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls and Why Were They Forgotten? I have listened to this many times. It's very insightful, very, a woman full of wisdom, uh, but really brings out some of the most powerful things you could ever imagine regarding the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I do believe still firmly that the Vatican has hid many of the scrolls that would shed more light. I know there's some people that don't agree with that. There are even, there are even scholars that have worked directly on the Dead Sea Scrolls that also say this is true. They did not reveal everything. Even John Strugnall, who saw the original Book of Enoch, uh, th there was one copy that was taken out of Cave 11. It was sold by the Bedouins to a bidder in Kuwait. The guy bought it there. As far as I know, it's never been purchased by anyone else. They've never been able to get it away from this one person there. But he said there was another book similar to that as well on the microfish that he got to see. But John did confirm one thing, that the book of Enoch that he saw on the microfish was nearly the same as the Ethiopian copy that we're used to today. Now, there's many fragments that were found in the book of Enoch. Uh, and even Dr. Um, uh, Elior, uh, Elior does confirm that the book of Enoch was part of the canonical uh, uh, library there, the, or, the, or the biblical library, I should say. But she says a couple of interesting things here that confirm or at least help strengthen uh, the book of Enoch to be a biblical text, or at least was believed by the Qumran community to be a biblical text there. She does it very much from a scholastic standpoint. She does not side with the information necessarily in there, but uh, gives the information for us to look at as a whole. She says here, a whole other group of books which were virtually unknown to us, we call it, as I said, parabiblical. And it is based on the following principle. You may take any figure from the Pentateuch and tell about him an elaborate story. Let's say we mirror with Enoch or from Noah or from Enoch or from Levi from the Pentateuch. These scrolls are telling us there is a book of Enoch. There is a book of Noah. There is a testament of Levi. Okay, building a case for there must be these books must exist, right? She goes on to say in another part of the video, the people who had authored the first book of Enoch, it is called the Ethiopian Enoch because it was first known to us in the language of Giz. I don't know if I spelled that right or not. I was transliterating her words. An Ethiopian Semitic language. In the book of Enoch, chapters 72 to 82, it is telling us a great detail on the calendar of 364 days. In the book of Psalms, we found in Qumran, entirely different in the extra Psalms, which were not known to us in the Bible. Okay, in other words, the Psalms that they found there, they, were this, they did have the same Psalms that were like we have in our Bible today, but they found a lot more of these Psalms. David had written 364 Psalms. Now watch what she says here, all right? Uh, she goes on, which were not known to us in the Bible, in the Psalm Scrolls, which is presented in the shrine of the book in column 27. In other words, if you go to column 27 of this, uh, in the shrine of the book, 
regarding the Psalm scroll, we are told that David, king of Israel, should, you know, the one we are told that is wise and poetically gifted and is a prophet according to the scroll, had authored 364 daily psalms for each day of the year. Now the point she brings this out is that in the Qumran scrolls, there's, there's the book of Psalms, it's 364 psalms in this one book, and David says he did it for each day of the year. Well, see, people used to downplay the book of Enoch as far as the Ethiopian version because it does speak about a 364-day-in-a-year calendar. And all of Israel today goes by 360-day, a lunar calendar. So they always thought that was a major problem. And she said that one thing, and if you go through the whole um, uh, lecture, she said the Qumran community was very much firm on the 364-day of year of cal the, the calendar there. I believe it's mentioned in the book of Jubilees, the same type of calendar. Uh, she goes on to say that how that David also had 52 Psalms that he wrote specifically for the Sabbaths uh, uh, during the year. Uh, he had wrote, I believe it was 18 Psalms, and if I got the numbers wrong, please forgive me. I'm just going by, trying to go by memory. 18 Psalms for the holidays uh, that were mentioned as well. She said these were things were totally unknown to the Jewish scholastic community whatsoever until the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Also, though, the book of Judah is another prime example uh, that authenticates the uh, the book of Enoch, and when it says, I will therefore put in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, this is important, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. So there were angels that left their heavenly abode, see, they left their own habitation, did not keep their first estate, and they're reserved in everlasting change in the darkness and judgment of the great day. What did they do? Well, Jude assumes that you know what they did because he knows they read the book of Enoch as part of their Bible. So he brings these things into our remembrance here. Now, we're familiar just doing a little comparison here. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. And believe me, all this is going to make sense to you in a little bit. It may seem like right now it doesn't, you know, brother, why are you going there? What, what has this got to do with what they did then and, and, and today? When you're looking at it prophetically, you're going to find out very soon. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, there's been always two schools of thought on this. One school says it's the fallen angels. It was the Nephilim, because it's, the Bible speak, speaks of in Genesis how there were giants in the, in the land, etc. Uh, and then there's the other school of thought that says, well, no, actually, this is Seth's sons, and, uh, and they just went and slept with, uh, with, with uh, uh, Cain's sons, and, and God never did forgive it. Well, that's completely doesn't make any sense at all, especially in light of the fact that we have the book of Enoch to back up what it says in Genesis. Because you have to cross-reference. You need these things to dovetail. You need these things to come together, and you need it to fit. The common thread, as I call it. And this is when I search these books. And even in the book of Enoch, where we have, because we're using basically the Ethiopic version here because we don't have the full one that they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, thanks to someone uh, passing that somewhere else. Uh, in fact, there's other books that they will not even release to you, and that's not a mystery. That's a plain-out fact, uh, but they won't release to you what it is. And one of those copies did make it to Europe, and no one wants to specify where in Europe it went to. Uh, but anyway, the point is, is we are always looking for the common thread. So we can link it with the canon that we have. Whether we're looking at the Apocrypha, where we look at the Book of Enoch, whether we look at uh, the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, the Humane Gospel, and there's even been people that say, oh, those are done by mystics and stuff like that. that this is, let me tell you something. There's more than one opinion on those books as well. And I, I, will, I have to say this because it's a fact. There is scholastic opinion 
that, that's totally contrary to that. So we have to weigh out both sides, not just the Vatican's version that's trying to uh, change history for everyone so no one really knows what happened. Uh, okay, so this is, this is the thing. We look for the common thread. I can't say that in any of these extra-biblical books that everything is perfectly just right. But then again, as I look for the common thread, like the other day when we shared with you, about the story of Joseph, and we were using the book of Jasher. I took and showed you clearly in the book of Leviticus and the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, it said that Joseph's brother sold him unto the, uh, I believe it's the Ishmaelites. And in the book of Leviticus, he sold him to the Midianites. So which one did he sell him to? Now this is our King James Version Bible that it says, one says he sold it to the Ishmaelites and one says he sold it to the, to the uh, Midianites. And we don't know which one he sold it to. But the book of Jasher, with the common thread in there, clears up the story to where we understand what really happened. Their intent was to sell him to the Ishmaelites. But instead, they sold him to the Midianites, and it was the Midianites that sold him to the Ishmaelites. All right, so this is the point. We look for those threads. We search it out. Not necessarily having a firm opinion one way or the other. But tonight, in the book of Enoch, there are some very interesting things that is going to shake you, I do believe. All right, so in the book of Enoch, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, just like Genesis, kind of odd that they fell in line together like that. It says, And it came to pass, when the children of men multiplied, that in those days were born to them beautiful and fair daughters. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? And the angels, the sons of heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said one to another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and have children with them. Now that's kind of odd, isn't it? Just like Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Well, now we know who those sons of God are, or the sons of heaven. It was the angels, or the fallen angels, the, watch, the watchers, as it's spoken of in the book of uh, Enoch there. Now, let's look at this a little bit closer there. Remember the famous prophecy that uh, is given by Jesus in Matthew 24, 38? For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now I went through this not too long ago, especially on the part about they were eating and drinking. Because if you want to know what they were eating and drinking in the days of Noah, it would do you good to go back to the book of Enoch that tells all the story about the days before Noah. Then we find out what were they doing. They were eating and drinking blood, and they were eating and drinking the flesh of human beings as well as the animals. That's what it says they were doing. Plain and simple. Don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. But this time we're going to focus on another part of the verse here, marrying and giving in marriage. As I put at the top of the screen there, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now, why does it mention marrying and giving into marriage? I never really thought about it before. But if you look at the two Greek words there, gamio and is gamido, gamido, it's actually got a D-like sound to that other Greek word there. The gameo is to marry, it's gender inclusive, a man or a woman. In other words, a man or a woman gets married, all right? And it doesn't matter which sex it is, they just get married. In other words, they come together. Whereas the eka, uh, ekgamizo, or getgamido, given a daughter to be married. When it says given in marriage, and then they're marrying, I believe that it's trying to identify what was happening in the days Yeshua was identifying because he's already telling you as it was in the days of Noah before the fall. In other words, one were just marrying, the other were given in marriage. Now, I don't know which one is which for sure. I would assume the marrying is regarding the fallen angels where they come and took for themselves wives, whoever they chose. There was no giving to them they were coming and taking who they chose to be for their wife. There was no fathers on earth giving their daughters unto the angels. They took them. And that's one reason why I kind of think that that may be where that's alluding to right there. And why Yeshua speaks of two different ways there. 
Let's look a little further here. Another comparison. Enoch chapter 7 verses 1 to 3. And of all of them together went and took wives for themselves, each choosing one for himself. And they began to go into them, defile themselves with sex with them. Well, having sex in a lawful marriage is not a defilement. But an unlawful marriage, there's where your defilement comes in. Not to mention God had never given them the permission to do it. Remember, Jesus, or the, I forget, what, forget where it is in the scripture where it says that as it is in the, the angels in heaven, that they, they, they do not marry or, not, or are they given in marriage. In fact, that might be a clue right there to the very scripture here. They neither marry nor are they given in marriage. Remember the scripture there? I forget exactly where that's at. They're neither married nor are they given in marriage. But yet here they were marrying and are given in marriage. Hmm, the angels of heaven, what do you know? That's an interesting scripture to think about it, isn't it? Where are you going with this, Steve? Well, we're going to get to that. I've worn my glasses so long today, it bothers my nose. I apologize. I have really fought the devil trying to get this message out to you guys too. You have no idea what, we have been, what I've been through today. Uh, and even yesterday, just to get this to you guys. Anyway, and uh, it says, uh, And the angels taught them charms and spells and cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And the women became pregnant, and they bare large giants whose heights were 3,000 cubits. I have no idea how big that is. That's got to be huge. Anyway, in Genesis uh, chapter 6, verse 2, it states this, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They took them wives of all which they chose, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Well, there's your common thread right there in the book of Enoch. Is that not true? Now, I want you to think about something, though. Let's look at it again. This is in chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to start moving this now to the time we're living in now. So think in that line there. As you begin to look at some of the things we're going to read here, start looking at the future. Chapter 8, verse 1. And Azel, Azazel, excuse me, um, taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates, taught them about metals of the earth, and the art of working them, and bracelets and ornaments, and the use of uh, at, at antimony, and the beautiful beautifying of the eyelids, all kinds of precious stones, and all coloring of dyes. Well, starting to look like that nowadays, isn't it? Even some of these new Barbie-type dolls, I know it's not Barbie that makes it, but they got alien-looking dolls in there. And today, I'm not against makeup, but you know what I mean? They flat out go to looking like something that you would think that maybe this is what the fallen angels were teaching when it said about the painting of the eyes. And of course, the technology using all kinds of metals and everything. Where did we get all this technology? Interesting. You think man's just that smart on his own? I don't know. The Industrial Revolution, as I wrote up here, came all sorts of advancements. Why is it that for nearly, what is it, I guess, if we've been on the earth for over 6,000 years or something like that, or just under, whatever the case may be, depending on which calendar you want to look at, uh, I would have to say that we have uh, not did a lot, of, a lot of advancement until modern times, or at least... If we go back to ancient and Egyptian civilization, it seemed that there were some advancements there. But it seems like advancements were always stifled. They were stopped by some kind of destruction or something. The Egyptians had some very advanced technology, but where did they get it from? Could it have been those fallen angels? Well, they've been reserved in, in chains of darkness. But wonder where it all comes from. Just can't help, can't help but wonder. Now, Enoch chapter 9. I'm giving you modern-day pictures to think about these things. And then Michael and Uriel, Raphael and Gabriel, looked down from heaven and saw much blood being shed on earth and all the lawless being done on the earth. All the lawless being done on the earth. Much blood was being shed. 
The picture we have here is ISIS with uh, 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 the Christians from the Middle East, and they're going to behead all of them. One, one brother against another brother over faith issues. Enoch chapter 9, verse 1. And Michael, Uriel, I'll just read it again. Raphael and Gabriel looked down from heaven and saw much blood being shed on earth and the lawless being done on the earth. The lawless being done. You know, I don't say this is the same, but it just kind of made me think of Daniel eleven fourteen. 14. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south and the children of the violent, uvane paratsi amcha, which literally is the sons of the lawless, among thy people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision, but they shall stumble. You see, they're trying to marry the vision. For one, Israel, just like Noah, was a called out people separated from this ungodly curse that is coming upon the earth. And Michael, and Uriel, and Raphael, and Gabriel, they look down. They see nothing but bloodshed on the earth and, the, and all the lawless being done. And the sons of the lawless in Israel are trying to help uh, promote the evils that's being done by the mother of all the children of today. Let's look more. Enoch 9. Chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. And they have gone to the daughters of men of the earth and have had sex with the women. All right, because now, now the, let, me, let me pull it up in the actual book of Enoch where I've got it right here. I did a skip there for you. Um, So we went from chapter 8, verse 1 of Enoch, or no, chapter 9, verse 1. And we dropped all the way down to, to verse 8 there. And some people might wonder what in the world was happening in between there. All right, so they, they see all this is going on. They said, uh, and they said to each other, let the cries from the destruction of the earth ascend to the gates of heaven. All right, remember also in Matthew 24, Yeshua talks about all the things that are going to happen on the earth, how the nation will rise against nation, kingdom will rise against kingdom. Uh, there will be earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows, right? Now this is what happens here. The, the, the judgment is being brought down for the evil and the wicked that the fallen angels did by coming in and cohabitating with the sons uh, or the daughters that were of the son of the, the daughters of man. They were cohabitating with them and bringing forth illegitimate children, right? So now we come to verse 8, and they have gone to the daughters of men the, of the earth and have had sex with the women and have defiled themselves and have revealed to them all kinds of sin. And the women have borne giants and the whole earth has thereby been filled with blood and unrighteousness. All because of bringing forth those giants. Let's look at Revelation chapter 17, and now we'll start getting to the core of what, we, what I wanted to share with you. Verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of the abomination of filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Does that kind of strike a bell? See, remember what he says in, in Enoch 8.1? And Azel taught men to make swords, knives, and shields, and breastplates. See, don't forget about all the blood and the martyrs. See, drunken with the blood of the saints. It's instruments of war. And the breast bracelets and ornaments. And the use of the, uh, of the uh, anatomy. And the beautiful of the eyelids and all kinds of precious stones. What does this horror of revelation have? Decked with gold and precious stones. In all coloring of dyes, go down to chapter 9, verse 9, And the woman bore giants, and the whole earth has thereby been filled with the blood of unrighteousness. What does it say in verse 6? 
Because remember now, in Revelation, these are happening as a result of what the horror of Revelation has done. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Death and violence. Remember what happened, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. They did eat and drink and were given in marriage. You know, according to Enoch, they could not fill the quota of these giants that were in the land. The, the sons of God, the, son, the true sons of God, of Adam, could not fulfill. They couldn't feed them. They were so big and huge, they couldn't keep up with the demand. So they turned on them. Today we have spiritual giants. We have spiritual giants through illegitimate, bringing forth illegitimate bastard children into the earth. When Yeshua came on the earth, he was a true son of God. He was the second Adam. And he brought forth a true believing people. But Constantine got a hold of that. And they formed a Catholic church, their universal church, and they went to putting to death anybody that didn't agree with them. Just like it was back in the Andalusian destruction or before the Andalusian destruction, those giants, they turned against Adam's children, Seth's children, Enoch, Lamech, all of them. And it became a violent chaos in the earth. Now we have a spiritual fornication, and it has produced also giants in the earth. Let me continue on to share, get to the point I mean here. The Vatican was a creation of Islam for the persecution of the Jews and Christians. This was on the, Je uh, the Jesuits called jesuit.web.com uh, forward slash Islam. Researcher and filmmaker Jim Arabito spoke at churches all across the country trying to warn people that the Roman Catholic hierarchy is the elite power behind the New World Order agenda. He was killed in a suspicious accident in 1990. Likewise, ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera warned that the Vatican is a whore of Babylon, spoken of the Book of Revelation. He said that the papal hierarchy and the Jesuit order are the most powerful entities at the top of the Illuminati power structure working to usher in a Luciferian New World Order. Riviera also published a book titled The Prophet. He wrote that when he was initiated as a Jesuit, Cardinal B, B -E -A, that is, explained to him the hidden history of Islam. B allegedly confessed that the Vatican created Islam to destroy the Jews and Christians. After the publication of his book, Riviera was poisoned to death in 1997. Now, very interesting. Uh, there are those that try to rebuff uh, or, or debunk uh, Alberto Rivera. Do a little research, you'll find out they're all Catholics. Won't go into any names. Protestants, it's time to come back. Catholic Stand. It's published on the Catholic Stand April the 2nd of 2013. To my Protestant brothers and sisters, says the author. It is time to come back to the Mother Church. We want you. We need you. We love you. I spent a lot of time in dialogue with activists, atheists recently, and the direction we are going is not pretty. We are witnessing a rapid cultural decline into immorality. We see here Pope Francis with the evangelical delegation that, uh, that, they, that they put together, Kenneth Copeland and, and the group there, coming back to their mother church. But the point is, according to Alberta Rivera, the mother of Islam is the Vatican. And what he says that Cardinal B says it's in the book that he wrote called The Prophet. Uh, as well, the Catholic Church has made no bones about it that they are the mother church and all the Protestants are their daughters. They make no bones about it. Another, uh, this church right here, this is uh, uh, Osteen's church, a mega giant of a church. The point I'm trying to bring out here, guys, Islam. 
These mega churches like Osteen's church, giants. The Protestant churches, the Episcopalians, whatever they may be out there. Any of them that are joining back up with the Vatican, they're all giants. You know, chapter 9, verse 9, and the woman have, have borne giants and the whore uh, and the whole earth is thereby been filled with the blood and unrighteousness. The unrighteousness is their, their theology is completely false. The blood is because of the wars. These giants are fighting with each other and they're killing each other. Islam, who the Vatican, she's the mama of Islam. Look at everything. You know, you, even if you don't want to take Albert Rivera for the example, look at, look at the Islam. Look at the way the women dress, same way the nuns dress. Look at the fact that they run around with their little beads on their hands too, their little prayer beads, just like the Catholic Church does. They got a rosary, so do the, so do the uh, Muslims, they got a rosary. Why do you think Adnan and Akhtar and, and, and this group here of these, uh, these Islamists are trying to come together to bring about a world peace and they're trying to, you know, he wants to be the Mahdi and they're trying to work with the Pope of Rome and all the other religious leaders. What are they doing? Like the fallen angels. And believe me, they are anointed of fallen angels. They're anointed of the devil himself. Remember, the devil is cast out of heaven and comes to earth and has but yet a short time. A fallen angel. And these fallen angels, these watchers, 200 of them, according to the book of Enoch, came down to this earth, cohabitated with women, and brought forth giants. And Satan, because he wanted to annihilate the true children of God, the Jewish people, people and it was that it was believing Jews in Yeshua himself when he came on the earth they believed their Messiah they believed him but what happened Constantine he didn't like what Jesus had to say so he needed to get his own church and state thing going and to annihilate anything that didn't agree with what church and state had to say but did you know Constantine later tried to apologize for what he did Eusebius had a lot of regrets as well you need to read some of this church history. It'd be interesting to know just exactly. There was such a major division with them. Big division. And Enoch shows his giants from the fallen angels. And here we have it again. Let's look some more here. Foreshadowing. Enoch chapter 10 verse 9. To Gabriel said, uh, said the Lord, Proceed against the bastards of the reprobates and against the children of fornication and destroy the children of fornication and the children of the watchers. Cause them to go against one another that they may destroy each other in battle. Shorten their days. Remember what Yeshua says? He's going to gather the wheat into his garner. He'll gather, he's going to separate between the tares and the wheat. First he tells them, don't, don't, don't try to do it while the harvest is going on. Let it go on up. Let them grow together. Let them grow together. He said, but at the harvest, he'll separate it, and he's going to gather the weeds together, and they're going to be burned. God don't have to kill you. He don't have to burn you. They're going to do it to themselves. All he does is, because of the fact of their evil and the wickedness and the way they went about it, it brings them against each other, and they destroy themselves. But look at what the scripture says as well in Matthew 24. Again, what Yeshua said then. For then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should, be, should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. When I read in the book of Enoch last night, and I read this last thing in yellow that's on your screen, Cause them to go against one another that they may destroy each other in battle. Shorten their days. Wow, the Holy Spirit began to work with me. Self-destruction is what shortens the days. See, look at it carefully. Except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. You know, there's scripture that speaks about where God will hide us during his wrath. 
That's not their wrath. That's his wrath. See? While they're out killing each other, Satan's out there killing each other, that's what's going to shorten the days. Time would go on longer if it wasn't for the fact that God's had enough and they've turned against each other. And except those days should be shortened. You see? So they're killing each other, shortening their own lives on the earth. Even the Pope of Rome made the statement, there won't be a Christmas next year. At the rate things are going. But here's what's interesting. In Enoch 13, 9, and when I awoke, what happened? The, let, me, let me give you a little bit of background here because we're jumping several chapters here. Those fallen angels come to Enoch and asked him to intercede for them on their behalf. They knew Enoch had already been taken up. And they asked him if he would intercede for them. The Lord wasn't very pleased with the fact that they asked this. And it's actually written, um, let's see here, I'll, I'll probably just have to elaborate on it. It says, and when I awoke and I came to them and they were, were all sitting gathered together weeping in Abi, Abi Asael, which is between Lebanon and Sinesser, with their faces covered. It's interesting where they were at in the Middle East. Do you know one of the reasons they were weeping and they were pleading unto God? According to the book of Enoch, because they loved their children. Just like the Pope of Rome loves his children. The Pope knows that they gave birth to Islam. The Pope knows he gave birth to all these other illegitimate harlot daughters of revelation. But he's done, you know, this is one thing that I never realized before. This man does love these people. He's not just making it fake, he does. Just like those, and it's not him per se, it's them demons inside of them. They created them. They created this fallen bunch of illegitimate churches in Islam. And not just, not just the, the Sunnis, it's also the Shiites. The only thing the difference is the Shiites have split from the Sunnis. Now the Shiites hate their mother. Then the scriptures say that son, you know, daughter will turn against mama, son against father. Maybe that's got a little bit to do with this here. So here, in this particular article here, this, was, this picture was taken off of uh, the Blaze, uh, the news broadcast there. They do also have a website there uh, on January 11th, 2016, this year. The Pope Francis to, to world leaders, very authentic practice of religion cannot fail to promote peace. He's not just meeting with world leaders. He's meeting with anybody and everybody. Why the world leaders? The world leaders are just like those religious heads as well. They have their huge, big world regime. And God is shortening the days. You know how he's shortening the days? He's allowed them to turn against each other. Because if he didn't shorten those days, there would be no flesh saved. Never thought about it like that. Neither did I. If he doesn't shorten the days by allowing the chaos, in other words, if he, if, it did, if he didn't do like he did in the book of Enoch, remember, Yeshua said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. If he did not shorten those days, there'd be no flesh saved. Why? Because they would continue to pervert the earth with their false doctrines. They would continue until they brought every single person underneath false doctrines. It wasn't supposed to happen this way, was it, Mr. Francis? Nobody expected it to go this way. Kind of hoping for a new world order. Now you're trying to bring peace just like Jesus said, they'll say peace and safety. There is no peace. Because God is shortening the days now. He's allowed them to turn against each other now. That's where the shortening of the days is. Just like it was 
just like it was. Let's back up a frame or two for you real quick. Remember Enoch chapter 10 verse 9. Cause them to go against one another that they may destroy each other in battle. Shorten their days. All this chaos. Don't worry. Don't worry, church. He'll hide you when his wrath comes on this earth. But all this wrath that's happening now, he's shortening the days because otherwise there would be no flesh saved. Now we can understand what Yeshua really meant by that statement. Anyway, some of the source material, I figured I'd put it up here for you because some of you may wonder. The book of Enoch that I'm using, there's several different sources out there. You can get whichever one you prefer there. I was writing the one uh, from the Lost Books of the Bible by Joseph B. Lumpkin. Also, the New Testament passages were the King James Version uh, Bible online, using the Sword and Mamre Bible online for the Old Testament Scriptures is what I use. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. I hope that gives you something to think about. It has certainly made me look a little different at how things are going today. We are definitely in the closing hours of history of the human race. But it's what will cut short the days or else none of us would make it. That's his mercy. He knows it can't continue on, friends, like this. It can't. It cannot continue on. So the days have got to be shortened as it was in the days of Noah. So is it today. I'm Stephen Benning of Israeli News Live.